9. The Role of Family and Friends in Shaping Your Habits In 1965, a Hungarian man named Laszlo Polgar wrote a series of strange letters to a woman named Clara. Laszlo was a firm believer in hard work. In fact, it was all he believed in. He completely rejected the idea of innate talent. He claimed that with deliberate practice and the development of good habits, a child could become a genius in any field. His mantra was a genius is not born, but is educated and trained. Laszlo believed in this idea so strongly that he wanted to test it with his own children and he was writing to Clara because he needed a wife willing to jump on board. Clara was a teacher and although she may not have been as adamant as Laszlo, she also believed that with proper instruction, anyone could advance their skills. Laszlo decided chess would be a suitable field for the experiment and he laid out a plan to raise his children to become chess prodigies. The kids would be homeschooled, a rarity in Hungary at the time. The house would be filled with chess books and pictures of famous chess players. The children would play against each other constantly and compete in the best tournaments they could find. The family would keep a meticulous file system of the tournament history of every competitor the children faced. Their lives would be dedicated to chess. Laszlo successfully courted Clara and within a few years, the Polgars were parents to three young girls, Susan, Sophia and Judith. Susan, the oldest, began playing chess when she was four years old. Within six months, she was defeating adults. Sophia, the middle child, did even better. By 14, she was a world champion and a few years later, she became a grandmaster. Judith, the youngest, was the best of all. By age five, she could beat her father. At twelve, she was the youngest player ever listed among the top 100 chess players in the world. At fifteen years and four months old, she became the youngest grandmaster of all time, younger than Bobby Fischer, the previous record holder. For twenty-seven years, she was the number one ranked female chess player in the world. The childhood of the Polgar sisters was atypical, to say the least. And yet, if you ask them about it, they claim their lifestyle was attractive, even enjoyable. In interviews, the sisters talk about their childhood as entertaining rather than grueling. They loved playing chess. They couldn't get enough of it. Once, Laszlo reportedly found Sofia playing chess in the bathroom in the middle of the night. Encouraging her to go back to sleep, he said, Sofia, leave the pieces alone. To which she replied, Daddy, they won't leave me alone. The Polgar sisters grew up in a culture that prioritized chess above all else, praised them for it, rewarded them for it. In their world, an obsession with chess was normal. And as we are about to see, whatever habits are normal in your culture are among the most attractive behaviors you'll find. The Seductive Pull of Social Norms Humans are herd animals. We want to fit in, to bond with others, and to earn the respect and approval of our peers. Such inclinations are essential to our survival. For most of our evolutionary history, our ancestors lived in tribes. Becoming separated from the tribe, or worse, being cast out, was a death sentence. The lone wolf dies, but the pack survives. Asterisk Meanwhile, those who collaborated and bonded with others enjoyed increased safety, mating opportunities, and access to resources. As Charles Darwin noted, in the long history of humankind, 
those who learned to collaborate and improvise most effectively have prevailed. As a result, one of the deepest human desires is to belong. And this ancient preference exerts a powerful influence on our modern behavior. We don't choose our earliest habits, we imitate them. We follow the script handed down by our friends and family, our church or school, our local community and society at large. Each of these cultures and groups comes with its own set of expectations and standards when and whether to get married, how many children to have, which holidays to celebrate, how much money to spend on your child's birthday party. In many ways, these social norms are the invisible rules that guide your behavior each day. You are always keeping them in mind, even if they are at the not top of your mind. Often, you follow the habits of your culture without thinking, without questioning, and sometimes without remembering. As the French philosopher Michel de Montaigne wrote, the customs and practices of life in society sweep us along. Most of the time, going along with the group does not feel like a burden. Everyone wants to belong. If you grow up in a family that rewards you for your chess skills, playing chess will seem like a very attractive thing to do. If you work in a job where everyone wears expensive suits, then you'll be inclined to splurge on one as well. If all of your friends are sharing an inside joke or using a new phrase, you'll want to do it, too, so they know that you get it. Behaviors are attractive when they help us fit in. We imitate the habits of three groups in particular. 1. The close. 2. The many. 3. The powerful. Each group offers an opportunity to leverage the second law of behavior change and make our habits more attractive. 1. Imitating the close. Proximity has a powerful effect on our behavior. This is true of the physical environment, as we discussed in Chapter 6, but it is also true of the social environment. We pick up habits from the people around us. We copy the way our parents handle arguments, the way our peers flirt with one another, the way our co-workers get results. When your friends smoke pot, you give it a try, too. When your wife has a habit of double-checking that the door is locked before going to bed, you pick it up as well. I find that I often imitate the behavior of those around me without realizing it. In conversation, I will automatically assume the body posture of the other person. In college, I began to talk like my roommates. When traveling to other countries, I unconsciously imitate the local accent despite reminding myself to stop. As a general rule, the closer we are to someone, the more likely we are to imitate some of their habits. One groundbreaking study tracked 12,000 people for 32 years and found that a person's chances of becoming obese increased by 57% if he or she had a friend who became obese. It works the other way, too. Another study found that if one person in a relationship lost weight, the other partner would also slim down about one-third of the time. Our friends and family provide a sort of invisible peer pressure that pulls us in their direction. Of course, peer pressure is bad only if you are surrounded by bad influences. When astronaut Mike Massimino was a graduate student at MIT, he took a small robotics class. Of the ten people in the class, four became astronauts. If your goal was to make it into space, then that room was about the best culture you could ask for. Similarly, one study found that the higher your best friend's IQ at age 11 or 12, the higher your IQ would be at age 15. 
even after controlling for natural levels of intelligence. We soak up the qualities and practices of those around us. One of the most effective things you can do to build better habits is to join a culture where your desired behavior is the normal behavior. New habits seem achievable when you see others doing them every day. If you are surrounded by fit people, you are more likely to consider working out to be a common habit. If you are surrounded by jazz lovers, you are more likely to believe it's reasonable to play jazz every day. Your culture sets your expectation for what is normal. Surround yourself with people who have the habits you want to have yourself. You'll rise together. To make your habits even more attractive, you can take this strategy one step further. Join a culture where, one, your desired behavior is the normal behavior and two, you already have something in common with the group. Steve Kumb, an entrepreneur in New York City, runs a company called Nerd Fitness, which helps nerds, misfits and mutants lose weight, get strong and get healthy. His clients include video game lovers, movie fanatics and average Joes who want to get in shape. Many people feel out of place the first time they go to the gym or try to change their diet, but if you are already similar to the other members of the group in some way, say, your mutual love of Star Wars change becomes more appealing because it feels like something people like you already do. Nothing sustains motivation better than belonging to the tribe. It transforms a personal quest into a shared one. Previously, you were on your own. Your identity was singular. You are a reader. You are a musician. You are an athlete. When you join a book club or a band or a cycling group, your identity becomes linked to those around you. Growth and change is no longer an individual pursuit. We are readers. We are musicians. We are cyclists. The shared identity begins to reinforce your personal identity. This is why remaining part of a group after achieving a goal is crucial to maintaining your habits. It's friendship and community that embed a new identity and help behaviors last over the long run. 2. Imitating the Many in the 1950s, psychologist Solomon Ast conducted a series of experiments that are now taught to legions of undergrads each year. To begin each experiment, the subject entered the room with a group of strangers. Unbeknownst to them, the other participants were actors planted by the researcher and instructed to deliver scripted answers to certain questions. The group would be shown one card with a line on it and then a second card with a series of lines. Each person was asked to select the line on the second card that was similar in length to the line on the first card. It was a very simple task. Here is an example of two cards used in the experiment. Conforming to social norms Figure 10 this is a representation of two cards used by Solomon Ast in his famous social conformity experiments. The length of the line on the first card, left, is obviously the same as line C, but when a group of actors claimed it was a different length, the research subjects would often change their minds and go with the crowd rather than believe their own eyes. The experiment always began the same. First, there would be some easy trials where everyone agreed on the correct line. After a few rounds, the participants were shown a test that was just as obvious as the previous ones, except the actors in the room would select an intentionally incorrect answer. For example, they would respond A to the comparison shown in figure 10. 
Everyone would agree that the lines were the same even though they were clearly different. The subject, who was unaware of the ruse, would immediately become bewildered. Their eyes would open wide. They would laugh nervously to themselves. They would double-check the reactions of other participants. Their agitation would grow as one person after another delivered the same incorrect response. Soon, the subject began to doubt their own eyes. Eventually, they delivered the answer they knew in their heart to be incorrect. Ast ran this experiment many times and in many different ways. What he discovered was that as the number of actors increased, so did the conformity of the subject. If it was just the subject and one actor, then there was no effect on the person's choice. They just assumed they were in the room with a dummy. When two actors were in the room with the subject, there was still little impact. But as the number of people increased to three actors and four and all the way to eight, the subject became more likely to second-guess themselves. By the end of the experiment, nearly 75% of the subjects had agreed with the group answer even though it was obviously incorrect. Whenever we are unsure how to act, we look to the group to guide our behavior. We are constantly scanning our environment and wondering, what is everyone else doing? We check reviews on Amazon or Yelp or TripAdvisor because we want to imitate the best buying, eating and travel habits. It's usually a smart strategy. There is evidence in numbers. But there can be a downside. The normal behavior of the tribe often overpowers the desired behavior of the individual. For example, one study found that when a chimpanzee learns an effective way to crack nuts open as a member of one group and then switches to a new group that uses a less effective strategy, it will avoid using the superior nut cracking method just to blend in with the rest of the chimps. Humans are similar. There is tremendous internal pressure to comply with the norms of the group. The reward of being accepted is often greater than the reward of winning an argument, looking smart, or finding truth. Most days, we'd rather be wrong with the crowd than be right by ourselves. The human mind knows how to get along with others. It wants to get along with others. This is our natural mode. You can override it. You can choose to ignore the group or to stop caring what other people think, but it takes work. Running against the grain of your culture requires extra effort. When changing your habits means challenging the tribe, change is unattractive. When changing your habits means fitting in with the tribe, change is very attractive. 3. Imitating the Powerful Humans everywhere pursue power, prestige, and status. We want pins and medallions on our jackets. We want president or partner in our titles. We want to be acknowledged, recognized, and praised. This tendency can seem vain, but overall, it's a smart move. Historically, a person with greater power and status has access to more resources, worries less about survival, and proves to be a more attractive mate. We are drawn to behaviors that earn us respect, approval, admiration, and status. We want to be the one in the gym who can do muscle-ups or the musician who can play the hardest chord progressions or the parent with the most accomplished children because these things separate us from the crowd. Once we fit in, we start looking for ways to stand out. This is one reason we care so much about the habits of highly effective people. We try to copy the behavior of successful people because we desire success ourselves. 
Many of our daily habits are imitations of people we admire. You replicate the marketing strategies of the most successful firms in your industry. You make a recipe from your favorite baker. You borrow the storytelling strategies of your favorite writer. You mimic the communication style of your boss. We imitate people we envy. High-status people enjoy the approval, respect, and praise of others. And that means if a behavior can get us approval, respect, and praise, we find it attractive. We are also motivated to avoid behaviors that would lower our status. We trim our hedges and mow our lawn because we don't want to be the slob of the neighborhood. When our mother comes to visit, we clean up the house because we don't want to be judged. We are continually wondering what will others think of me and altering our behavior based on the answer. The Polgar sisters, the chess prodigies mentioned at the beginning of this chapter, are evidence of the powerful and lasting impact social influences can have on our behavior. The sisters practiced chess for many hours each day and continued this remarkable effort for decades. But these habits and behaviors maintained their attractiveness, in part, because they were valued by their culture. From the praise of their parents to the achievement of different status markers like becoming a grandmaster, they had many reasons to continue their effort. Chapter Summary the culture we live in determines which behaviors are attractive to us. We tend to adopt habits that are praised and approved of by our culture because we have a strong desire to fit in and belong to the tribe. We tend to imitate the habits of three social groups, the close, family and friends, the many, the tribe, and the powerful, those with status and prestige. One of the most effective things you can do to build better habits is to join a culture where 1. Your desired behavior is the normal behavior and 2. You already have something in common with the group. The normal behavior of the tribe often overpowers the desired behavior of the individual. Most days, we'd rather be wrong with the crowd than be right by ourselves. If a behavior can get us approval, respect, and praise, we find it attractive. 10. How to find and fix the causes of your bad habits In late 2012, I was sitting in an old apartment just a few blocks from Istanbul's most famous street, Istiklal Kadesi. I was in the middle of a four-day trip to Turkey and my guide, Mike, was relaxing in a worn-out armchair a few feet away. Mike wasn't really a guide. He was just a guy from Mane who had been living in Turkey for five years, but he offered to show me around while I was visiting the country and I took him up on it. On this particular night, I had been invited to dinner with him and a handful of his Turkish friends. There were seven of us, and I was the only one who hadn't, at some point, smoked at least one pack of cigarettes per day. I asked one of the Turks how he got started. Friends, he said. It always starts with your friends. One friend smokes, then you try it. What was truly fascinating was that half of the people in the room had managed to quit smoking. Mike had been smoke-free for a few years at that point, and he swore up and down that he broke the habit because of a book called Alan Carr's Easy Way to Stop Smoking. It frees you from the mental burden of smoking, he said. It tells you, stop lying to yourself. You know you don't actually want to smoke. You know you don't really enjoy this. It helps you feel like you are not the victim anymore. You start to realize that you don't need to smoke. I had never tried a cigarette, 
but I took a look at the book afterward out of curiosity. The author employs an interesting strategy to help smokers eliminate their cravings. He systematically reframes each cue associated with smoking and gives it a new meaning. He says things like, You think you are quitting something, but you are not quitting anything because cigarettes do nothing for you. You think smoking is something you need to do to be social, but it's not. You can be social without smoking at all. You think smoking is about relieving stress, but it's not. Smoking does not relieve your nerves, it destroys them. Over and over, he repeats these phrases and others like them. Get it clearly into your mind, he says. You are losing nothing and you are making marvelous positive gains not only in health energy and money but also in confidence, self-respect, freedom and, most important of all, in the length and quality of your future life. By the time you get to the end of the book, smoking seems like the most ridiculous thing in the world to do. And if you no longer expect smoking to bring you any benefits, you have no reason to smoke. It is an inversion of the second law of behavior change, make it unattractive. Now, I know this idea might sound overly simplistic. Just change your mind and you can quit smoking. But stick with me for a minute. Where cravings come from? Every behavior has a surface level craving and a deeper underlying motive. I often have a craving that goes something like this, I want to eat tacos. If you were to ask me why I want to eat tacos, I wouldn't say, because I need food to survive. But the truth is, somewhere deep down, I am motivated to eat tacos because I have to eat to survive. The underlying motive is to obtain food, and water even if my specific craving is for a taco. Some of our underlying motives include asterisk. Conserve energy obtain food and water. Find love and reproduce connect and bond with others. Win social acceptance and approval reduce uncertainty. Achieve status and prestige. A craving is just a specific manifestation of a deeper underlying motive. Your brain did not evolve with a desire to smoke cigarettes or to check Instagram or to play video games. At a deep level, you simply want to reduce uncertainty and relieve anxiety to win social acceptance and approval or to achieve status. Look at nearly any product that is habit-forming and you'll see that it does not create a new motivation, but rather latches onto the underlying motives of human nature. Find love and reproduce is equal to using Tinder. Connect and bond with others is equal to browsing Facebook. Win social acceptance and approval is equal to posting on Instagram. Reduce uncertainty is equal to searching on Google. Achieve status and prestige is equal to playing video games. Your habits are modern-day solutions to ancient desires. New versions of old vices. The underlying motives behind human behavior remain the same. The specific habits we perform differ based on the period of history. Here is the powerful part. There are many different ways to address the same underlying motive. One person might learn to reduce stress by smoking a cigarette. Another person learns to ease their anxiety by going for a run. Your current habits are not necessarily the best way to solve the problems you face, they are just the methods you learned to use. Once you associate a solution with the problem you need to solve, you keep coming back to it. Habits are all about associations. These associations determine whether we predict a habit to be worth repeating or not. 
As we covered in our discussion of the first law, your brain is continually absorbing information and noticing cues in the environment. Every time you perceive a cue, your brain runs a simulation and makes a prediction about what to do in the next moment. Cue, you notice that the stove is hot. Prediction, if I touch it I will get burned, so I should avoid touching it. Cue, you see that the traffic light turned green. Prediction, if I step on the gas, I will make it safely through the intersection and get closer to my destination, so I should step on the gas. You see a cue, categorize it based on past experience and determine the appropriate response. This all happens in an instant, but it plays a crucial role in your habits because every action is preceded by a prediction. Life feels reactive, but it is actually predictive. All day long, you are making your best guess of how to act given what you have just seen and what has worked for you in the past. You are endlessly predicting what will happen in the next moment. Our behavior is heavily dependent on these predictions. Put another way, our behavior is heavily dependent on how we interpret the events that happen to us, not necessarily the objective reality of the events themselves. Two people can look at the same cigarette, and one feels the urge to smoke while the other is repulsed by the smell. The same cue can spark a good habit or a bad habit depending on your prediction. The cause of your habits is actually the prediction that precedes them. These predictions lead to feelings, which is how we typically describe a craving, a feeling, a desire, an urge. Feelings and emotions transform the cues we perceive and the predictions we make into a signal that we can apply. They help explain what we are currently sensing. For instance, whether or not you realize it, you are noticing how warm or cold you feel right now. If the temperature drops by one degree, you probably won't do anything. If the temperature drops 10 degrees, however, you'll feel cold and put on another layer of clothing. Feeling cold was the signal that prompted you to act. You have been sensing the cues the entire time, but it is only when you predict that you would be better off in a different state that you take action. A craving is the sense that something is missing. It is the desire to change your internal state. When the temperature falls, there is a gap between what your body is currently sensing and what it wants to be sensing. This gap between your current state and your desired state provides a reason to act. Desire is the difference between where you are now and where you want to be in the future. Even the tiniest action is tinged with the motivation to feel differently than you do in the moment. When you binge eat or light up or browse social media, what you really want is not a potato chip or a cigarette or a bunch of likes. What you really want is to feel different. Our feelings and emotions tell us whether to hold steady in our current state or to make a change. They help us decide the best course of action. Neurologists have discovered that when emotions and feelings are impaired, we actually lose the ability to make decisions. We have no signal of what to pursue and what to avoid. As the neuroscientist Antonio Damasio explains, it is emotion that allows you to mark things as good, bad or indifferent. To summarize, the specific cravings you feel and habits you perform are really an attempt to address your fundamental underlying motives. Whenever a habit successfully addresses a motive, you develop a craving to do it again. In time, you learn to predict that checking social media will help you feel loved or that watching YouTube will allow you to forget your fears. Habits are attractive when we associate them 
with positive feelings and we can use this insight to our advantage rather than to our detriment. How to reprogram your brain to enjoy hard habits? You can make hard habits more attractive if you can learn to associate them with a positive experience. Sometimes all you need is a slight mindset shift. For instance, we often talk about everything we have to do in a given day. You have to wake up early for work. You have to make another sales call for your business. You have to cook dinner for your family. Now, imagine changing just one word. You don't have to. You get to. You get to wake up early for work. You get to make another sales call for your business. You get to cook dinner for your family. By simply changing one word, you shift the way you view each event. You transition from seeing these behaviors as burdens and turn them into opportunities. The key point is that both versions of reality are true. You have to do those things and you also get to do them. We can find evidence for whatever mindset we choose. I once heard a story about a man who uses a wheelchair. When asked if it was difficult being confined, he responded, I'm not confined to my wheelchair, I am liberated by it. If it wasn't for my wheelchair, I would be bedbound and never able to leave my house. This shift in perspective completely transformed how he lived each day. Reframing your habits to highlight their benefits rather than their drawbacks is a fast and lightweight way to reprogram your mind and make a habit seem more attractive. Exercise Many people associate exercise with being a challenging task that drains energy and wears you down. You can just as easily view it as a way to develop skills and build you up. Instead of telling yourself, I need to go run in the morning, say it's time to build endurance and get fast. Finance Saving money is often associated with sacrifice. However, you can associate it with freedom rather than limitation if you realize one simple truth. Living below your current means increases your future means. The money you save this month increases your purchasing power next month. Meditation Anyone who has tried meditation for more than 3 seconds knows how frustrating it can be when the next distraction inevitably pops into your mind. You can transform frustration into delight when you realize that each interruption gives you a chance to practice returning to your breath. Distraction is a good thing because you need distractions to practice meditation. Pregame Jitters Many people feel anxious before delivering a big presentation or competing in an important event. They experience quicker breathing, a faster heart rate, heightened arousal. If we interpret these feelings negatively, then we feel threatened and tense up. If we interpret these feelings positively, then we can respond with fluidity and grace. You can reframe I am nervous to I am excited and I am getting an adrenaline rush to help me concentrate. These little mindset shifts aren't magic but they can help change the feelings you associate with a particular habit or situation. If you want to take it a step further, you can create a motivation ritual. You simply practice associating your habits with something you enjoy, then you can use that cue whenever you need a bit of motivation. For instance, if you always play the same song before having sex, then you'll begin to link the music with the act. Whenever you want to get in the mood, just press play. Ed Latimore, a boxer and writer from Pittsburgh, benefited from a similar strategy without knowing it. Odd realization, he wrote. My focus and concentration goes up just by putting my headphones 
on while writing. I don't even have to play any music. Without realizing it, he was conditioning himself. In the beginning, he put his headphones on, played some music he enjoyed and did focused work. After doing it 5, 10, 20 times, Putting his headphones on became a cue that he automatically associated with increased focus. The craving followed naturally. Athletes use similar strategies to get themselves in the mindset to perform. During my baseball career, I developed a specific ritual of stretching and throwing before each game. The whole sequence took about 10 minutes and I did it the same way every single time. While it physically warmed me up to play, more importantly, it put me in the right mental state. I began to associate my pregame ritual with feeling competitive and focused. Even if I wasn't motivated beforehand, by the time I was done with my ritual, I was in game mode. You can adapt this strategy for nearly any purpose. Say you want to feel happier in general. Find something that makes you truly happy, like petting your dog or taking a bubble bath, and then create a short routine that you perform every time before you do the thing you love. Maybe you take three deep breaths and smile. Three deep breaths. Smile. Pet the dog. Repeat. Eventually, you'll begin to associate this breathe and smile routine with being in a good mood. It becomes a cue that means feeling happy. Once established, you can break it out anytime you need to change your emotional state. Stressed at work. Take three deep breaths and smile. Sad about life. Three deep breaths and smile. Once a habit has been built, the cue can prompt a craving, even if it has little to do with the original situation. The key to finding and fixing the causes of your bad habits is to reframe the associations you have about them. It's not easy, but if you can reprogram your predictions, you can transform a hard habit into an attractive one. Chapter Summary The inversion of the second law of behavior change is make it unattractive. Every behavior has a surface-level craving and a deeper underlying motive. Your habits are modern-day solutions to ancient desires. The cause of your habits is actually the prediction that precedes them. The prediction leads to a feeling. Highlight the benefits of avoiding a bad habit to make it seem unattractive. Habits are attractive when we associate them with positive feelings and unattractive when we associate them with negative feelings. Create a motivation ritual by doing something you enjoy immediately before a difficult habit. How to create a good habit? The first law, make it obvious. 1.1. Fill out the habits scorecard. Write down your current habits to become aware of them. 1.2. Use implementation intentions, I will, behavior, at, time, in, location, dot. 1.3. Use habit stacking, after, current habit, I will, new habit, dot. 1.4. Design your environment. Make the cues of good habits obvious and visible. The second law, make it attractive. 2.1. Use temptation bundling. Pair an action you want to do with an action you need to do. 2.2. Join a culture where your desired behavior is the normal behavior. 2.3. Create a motivation ritual. Do something you enjoy immediately before a difficult habit. The third law, make it easy. The fourth law, make it satisfying. How to break a bad habit. Inversion of the first law, make it invisible. 1.5. Reduce exposure. 
Remove the cues of your bad habits from your environment. Inversion of the second law, make it unattractive. 2.4. Reframe your mindset. Highlight the benefits of avoiding your bad habits. Inversion of the third law, make it difficult. Inversion of the fourth law, make it unsatisfying. The third law, make it easy. 11. Walk slowly, but never backward. On the first day of class, Jerry Uelsman, a professor at the University of Florida, divided his film photography students into two groups. Everyone on the left side of the classroom, he explained, would be in the quantity group. They would be graded solely on the amount of work they produced. On the final day of class, he would tally the number of photos submitted by each student. 100 photos would rate an A, 90 photos A, B, 80 photos A, C, and so on. Meanwhile, everyone on the right side of the room would be in the quality group. They would be graded only on the excellence of their work. They would only need to produce one photo during the semester, but to get an A, it had to be a nearly perfect image. At the end of the term, he was surprised to find that all the best photos were produced by the quantity group. During the semester, these students were busy taking photos, experimenting with composition and lighting, testing out various methods in the darkroom and learning from their mistakes. In the process of creating hundreds of photos, they honed their skills. Meanwhile, the quality group sat around speculating about perfection. In the end, they had little to show for their efforts other than unverified theories and one mediocre photo asterisk. It is easy to get bogged down trying to find the optimal plan for change, the fastest way to lose weight, the best program to build muscle, the perfect idea for a side hustle. We are so focused on figuring out the best approach that we never get around to taking action. As Voltaire once wrote, the best is the enemy of the good. I refer to this as the difference between being in motion and taking action. The two ideas sound similar, but they are not the same. When you are in motion, you are planning and strategizing and learning. Those are all good things, but they don't produce a result. Action, on the other hand, is the type of behavior that will deliver an outcome. If I outline 20 ideas for articles I want to write, that's motion. If I actually sit down and write an article, that's action. If I search for a better diet plan and read a few books on the topic, that's motion. If I actually eat a healthy meal, that's action. Sometimes motion is useful, but it will never produce an outcome by itself. It doesn't matter how many times you go talk to the personal trainer, that motion will never get you in shape. Only the action of working out will get the result you are looking to achieve. If motion doesn't lead to results, why do we do it? Sometimes we do it because we actually need to plan or learn more. But more often than not, we do it because motion allows us to feel like we are making progress without running the risk of failure. Most of us are experts at avoiding criticism. It doesn't feel good to fail or to be judged publicly, so we tend to avoid situations where that might happen. And that's the biggest reason why you slip into motion rather than taking action, you want to delay failure. It's easy to be in motion and convince yourself that you are still making progress. You think, I have got conversations going with four potential clients right now. This is good. We are moving in the right direction. Or, I brainstormed some ideas for that book I want to write. 
This is coming together. Motion makes you feel like you are getting things done. But really, you are just preparing to get something done. When preparation becomes a form of procrastination, you need to change something. You don't want to merely be planning. You want to be practicing. If you want to master a habit, the key is to start with repetition, not perfection. You don't need to map out every feature of a new habit. You just need to practice it. This is the first takeaway of the third law. You just need to get your reps in. How long does it actually take to form a new habit? Habit formation is the process by which a behavior becomes progressively more automatic through repetition. The more you repeat an activity, the more the structure of your brain changes to become efficient at that activity. Neuroscientists call this long-term potentiation, which refers to the strengthening of connections between neurons in the brain based on recent patterns of activity. With each repetition, cell-to-cell -cell signaling improves and the neural connections tighten. First described by neuropsychologist Donald Hebb in 1949, this phenomenon is commonly known as Hebb's law, neurons that fire together wire together. Repeating a habit leads to clear physical changes in the brain. In musicians, the cerebellum, critical for physical movements like plucking a guitar string or pulling a violin bow, is larger than it is in non-musicians. Mathematicians, meanwhile, have increased gray matter in the inferior parietal lobule, which plays a key role in computation and calculation. Its size is directly correlated with the amount of time spent in the field, the older and more experienced the mathematician, the greater the increase in gray matter. When scientists analyzed the brains of taxi drivers in London, they found that the hippocampus, a region of the brain involved in spatial memory, was significantly larger in their subjects than in non-taxi drivers. Even more fascinating, the hippocampus decreased in size when a driver retired. Like the muscles of the body responding to regular weight training, particular regions of the brain adapt as they are used and atrophy as they are abandoned. Of course, the importance of repetition in establishing habits was recognized long before neuroscientists began poking around. In 1860, the English philosopher George H. Luce noted, in learning to speak a new language, to play on a musical instrument, or to perform unaccustomed movements, great difficulty is felt, because the channels through which each sensation has to pass have not become established, but no sooner has frequent repetition cut a pathway, than this difficulty vanishes, the actions become so automatic that they can be performed while the mind is otherwise engaged. Both common sense and scientific evidence agree, repetition is a form of change. Each time you repeat an action, you are activating a particular neural circuit associated with that habit. This means that simply putting in your reps is one of the most critical steps you can take to encoding a new habit. It is why the students who took tons of photos improved their skills while those who merely theorized about perfect photos did not. One group engaged in active practice, the other in passive learning. One in action, the other in motion. All habits follow a similar trajectory from effortful practice to automatic behavior, a process known as automaticity. Automaticity is the ability to perform a behavior without thinking about each step, which occurs when the non-conscious mind takes over. It looks something like this. The habit line. Figure 11, in the beginning, point A, a habit requires a good deal of effort and concentration to perform. After a few repetitions, point B, it gets easier, 
but still requires some conscious attention. With enough practice, point C, the habit becomes more automatic than conscious. Beyond this threshold, the habit line, the behavior can be done more or less without thinking. A new habit has been formed. On the following page, you'll see what it looks like when researchers track the level of automaticity for an actual habit like walking for 10 minutes each day. The shape of these charts, which scientists call learning curves, reveals an important truth about behavior change, habits form based on frequency, not time. Walking 10 minutes per day. Figure 12, this graph shows someone who built the habit of walking for 10 minutes after breakfast each day. Notice that as the repetitions increase, so does automaticity, until the behavior is as easy and automatic as it can be. One of the most common questions I hear is, how long does it take to build a new habit? But what people really should be asking is, how many does it take to form a new habit? That is, how many repetitions are required to make a habit automatic? There is nothing magical about time passing with regard to habit formation. It doesn't matter if it's been 21 days or 30 days or 300 days. What matters is the rate at which you perform the behavior. You could do something twice in 30 days or 200 times. It's the frequency that makes the difference. Your current habits have been internalized over the course of hundreds, if not thousands, of repetitions. New habits require the same level of frequency. You need to string together enough successful attempts until the behavior is firmly embedded in your mind and you cross the habit line. In practice, it doesn't really matter how long it takes for a habit to become automatic. What matters is that you take the actions you need to take to make progress. Whether an action is fully automatic is of less importance. To build a habit, you need to practice it. And the most effective way to make practice happen is to adhere to the third law of behavior change, make it easy. The chapters that follow will show you how to do exactly that. Chapter Summary The third law of behavior change is make it easy. The most effective form of learning is practice, not planning. Focus on taking action, not being in motion. Habit formation is the process by which a behavior becomes progressively more automatic through repetition. The amount of time you have been performing a habit is not as important as the number of times you have performed it. 12. The Law of Least Effort In his award-winning book, Guns, Jumps and Steel, Anthropologist and biologist Jared Diamond points out a simple fact different. Continents have different shapes. At first glance, this statement seems rather obvious and unimportant, but it turns out to have a profound impact on human behavior. The primary axis of the Americas runs from north to south. That is, the landmass of North and South America tends to be tall and thin rather than wide and fat. The same is generally true for Africa. Meanwhile, the landmass that makes up Europe, Asia and the Middle East is the opposite. This massive stretch of land tends to be more east-west in shape. According to Diamond, this difference in shape played a significant role in the spread of agriculture over the centuries. When agriculture began to spread around the globe, farmers had an easier time expanding along east-west routes than along north-south ones. This is because locations along the same latitude generally share similar climates, amounts of sunlight and rainfall, and changes in season. These factors allowed farmers in Europe, 
and Asia to domesticate a few crops and grow them along the entire stretch of land from France to China. The Shape of Human Behavior Figure 13, the primary axis of Europe and Asia is east-west. The primary axis of the Americas and Africa is north-south. This leads to a wider range of climates up and down the Americas than across Europe and Asia. As a result, agriculture spread nearly twice as fast across Europe and Asia than it did elsewhere. The behavior of farmers, even across hundreds or thousands of years, was constrained by the amount of friction in the environment. By comparison, the climate varies greatly when traveling from north to south. Just imagine how different the weather is in Florida compared to Canada. You can be the most talented farmer in the world, but it won't help you grow Florida oranges in the Canadian winter. Snow is a poor substitute for soil. In order to spread crops along north-south routes, farmers would need to find and domesticate new plants whenever the climate changed. As a result, agriculture spread two to three times faster across Asia and Europe than it did up and down the Americas. Over the span of centuries, this small difference had a very big impact. Increased food production allowed for more rapid population growth. With more people, these cultures were able to build stronger armies and were better equipped to develop new technologies. The changes started out small, a crop that spread slightly farther, a population that grew slightly faster but compounded into substantial differences over time. The spread of agriculture provides an example of the third law of behavior change on a global scale. Conventional wisdom holds that motivation is the key to habit change. Maybe if you really wanted it, you'd actually do it. But the truth is, our real motivation is to be lazy and to do what is convenient. And despite what the latest productivity bestseller will tell you, this is a smart strategy, not a dumb one. Energy is precious, and the brain is wired to conserve it whenever possible. It is human nature to follow the law of least effort, which states that when deciding between two similar options, people will naturally gravitate toward the option that requires the least amount of work, asterisk, for example, expanding your farm to the east where you can grow the same crops rather than heading north where the climate is different. Out of all the possible actions we could take, the one that is realized is the one that delivers the most value for the least effort. We are motivated to do what is easy. Every action requires a certain amount of energy. The more energy required, the less likely it is to occur. If your goal is to do a hundred push-ups per day, that's a lot of energy. In the beginning, when you are motivated and excited, you can muster the strength to get started. But after a few days, such a massive effort feels exhausting. Meanwhile, sticking to the habit of doing one push-up per day requires almost no energy to get started. And the less energy a habit requires, the more likely it is to occur. Look at any behavior that fills up much of your life and you'll see that it can be performed with very low levels of motivation. Habits like scrolling on our phones, checking email, and watching television steal so much of our time because they can be performed almost without effort. They are remarkably convenient. In a sense, every habit is just an obstacle to getting what you really want. Dieting is an obstacle to getting fit. Meditation is an obstacle to feeling calm. Journaling is an obstacle to thinking clearly. You don't actually want the habit itself. What you really want is the outcome the habit delivers.
the greater the obstacle that is the more difficult the habit the more friction there is between you and your desired end state this is why it is crucial to make your habits so easy that you'll do them even when you don't feel like it if you can make your good habits more convenient you'll be more likely to follow through on them but what about all the moments when we seem to do the opposite if we are all so lazy then how do you explain people accomplishing hard things like raising a child or starting a business or climbing mount everest certainly you are capable of doing very hard things the problem is that some days you feel like doing the hard work and some days you feel like giving in on the tough days it's crucial to have as many things working in your favor as possible so that you can overcome the challenges life naturally throws your way the less friction you face the easier it is for your stronger self to emerge the idea behind make it easy is not to only do easy things the idea is to make it as easy as possible in the moment to do things that pay off in the long run how to achieve more with less effort imagine you are holding a garden hose that is bent in the middle some water can flow through but not very much If you want to increase the rate at which water passes through the hose you have two options The first option is to crank up the valve and force more water out The second option is to simply remove the bend in the hose and let water flow through naturally Trying to pump up your motivation to stick with a hard habit is like trying to force water through a bent hose You can do it but it requires a lot of effort and increases the tension in your life meanwhile making your habits simple and easy is like removing the bend in the hose rather than trying to overcome the friction in your life you reduce it one of the most effective ways to reduce the friction associated with your habits is to practice environment design in chapter 6 We discussed environment design as a method for making cues more obvious, but you can also optimize your environment to make actions easier. For example, when deciding where to practice a new habit, it is best to choose a place that is already along the path of your daily routine. Habits are easier to build when they fit into the flow of your life. You are more likely to go to the gym if it is on your way to work because stopping doesn't add much friction to your lifestyle. By comparison, if the gym is of the path of your normal commute even by just a few blocks, now you are going out of your way to get there. Perhaps even more effective is reducing the friction within your home or office. Too often We try to start habits in high friction environments. We try to follow a strict diet while we are out to dinner with friends. We try to write a book in a chaotic household. We try to concentrate while using a smartphone filled with distractions. It doesn't have to be this way. We can remove the points of friction that hold us back. This is precisely what electronics manufacturers in Japan began to do in the 1970s. In an article published in the New Yorker titled Better All the Time, James Surovecki writes, Japanese firms emphasized what came to be known as lean production, relentlessly looking to remove waste of all kinds from the production process down to redesigning workspaces. so workers didn't have to waste time twisting and turning to reach their tools the result was that japanese factories were more efficient and japanese products were more reliable than american ones in 1974 service calls for american made color televisions were five times as common as for japanese televisions by 1979 It took American workers 
three times as long to assemble their sets. I like to refer to this strategy as addition by subtraction, asterisk the Japanese companies looked for every point of friction in the manufacturing process and eliminated it. As they subtracted wasted effort, they added customers and revenue. Similarly, when we remove the points of friction that sap our time and energy, we can achieve more with less effort. This is one reason tidying up can feel so good. We are simultaneously moving forward and lightening the cognitive load our environment places on us. If you look at the most habit-forming products, you'll notice that one of the things these goods and services do best is remove little bits of friction from your life. Meal delivery services reduce the friction of shopping for groceries. Dating apps reduce the friction of making social introductions. Ride-sharing services reduce the friction of getting across town. Text messaging reduces the friction of sending a letter in the mail. Like a Japanese television manufacturer redesigning their workspace to reduce wasted motion, successful companies design their products to automate, eliminate, or simplify as many steps as possible. They reduce the number of fields on each form. They pare down the number of clicks required to create an account. They deliver their products with easy-to-understand directions or ask their customers to make fewer choices. When the first voice activated speakers were released, products like Google Home, Amazon Echo, and Apple HomePod, I asked a friend what he liked about the product he had purchased. He said it was just easier to say play some country music than to pull out his phone, open the music app, and pick a playlist. Of course, just a few years earlier, having unlimited access to music in your pocket was a remarkably frictionless behavior compared to driving to the store and buying a CD. Business is a never-ending quest to deliver the same result in an easier fashion. Similar strategies have been used effectively by governments. When the British government wanted to increase tax collection rates, they switched from sending citizens to a web page where the tax form could be downloaded to linking directly to the form. Reducing that one step in the process increased the response rate from 19.2% to 23.4%. For a country like the United Kingdom, those percentage points represent millions in tax revenue. The central idea is to create an environment where doing the right thing is as easy as possible. Much of the battle of building better habits comes down to finding ways to reduce the friction associated with our good habits and increase the friction associated with our bad ones. Prime the environment for future use Oswald Knuckles is an IT developer from Natchez, Mississippi. He is also someone who understands the power of priming his environment. Nichols dialed in his cleaning habits by following a strategy he refers to as resetting the room. For instance, when he finishes watching television, he places the remote back on the TV stand, arranges the pillows on the couch, and folds the blanket. When he leaves his car, he throws any trash away. Whenever he takes a shower, he wipes down the toilet while the shower is warming up. As he notes, the perfect time to clean the toilet is right before you wash yourself in the shower anyway. The purpose of resetting each room is not simply to clean up after the last action, but to prepare for the next action. When I walk into a room everything is in its right place, Nichols wrote. Because I do this every day in every room, Stuff always stays in good shape. People think I work hard but I'm actually really lazy. I'm just proactively lazy. It gives you so much time back. Whenever you organize a space for its intended purpose, 
you are priming it to make the next action easy. For instance, my wife keeps a box of greeting cards that are presorted by occasion, birthday, sympathy, wedding, graduation, and more. Whenever necessary, she grabs an appropriate card and sends it off. She is incredibly good at remembering to send cards because she has reduced the friction of doing so. For years, I was the opposite. Someone would have a baby and I would think, I should send a card. But then weeks would pass and by the time I remembered to pick one up at the store, it was too late. The habit wasn't easy. There are many ways to prime your environment so it's ready for immediate use. If you want to cook a healthy breakfast, place the skillet on the stove, set the cooking spray on the counter and lay out any plates and utensils you'll need the night before. When you wake up, making breakfast will be easy. Want to draw more? Put your pencils, pens, notebooks, and drawing tools on top of your desk within easy reach. Want to exercise? Set out your workout clothes, shoes, gym bag, and water bottle ahead of time. Want to improve your diet? Chop up a ton of fruits and vegetables on weekends and pack them in containers so you have easy access to healthy, ready-to-eat options during the week. These are simple ways to make the good habit the path of least resistance. You can also invert this principle and prime the environment to make bad behaviors difficult. If you find yourself watching too much television, for example, then unplug it after each use. Only plug it back in if you can say out loud the name of the show you want to watch. This setup creates just enough friction to prevent mindless viewing. If that doesn't do it, you can take it a step further. Unplug the television and take the batteries out of the remote after each use, so it takes an extra 10 seconds to turn it back on. And if you are really hardcore, move the television out of the living room and into a closet after each use. You can be sure you'll only take it out when you really want to watch something. The greater the friction, the less likely the habit. Whenever possible, I leave my phone in a different room until lunch. When it's right next to me, I will check it all morning for no reason at all. But when it is in another room, I rarely think about it. And the friction is high enough that I won't go get it without a reason. As a result, I get 3 to 4 hours each morning when I can work without interruption. If sticking your phone in another room doesn't seem like enough, tell a friend or family member to hide it from you for a few hours. Ask a coworker to keep it at their desk in the morning and give it back to you at lunch. It is remarkable how little friction is required to prevent unwanted behavior. When I hide beer in the back of the fridge where I can't see it, I drink less. When I delete social media apps from my phone, it can be weeks before I download them again and log in. These tricks are unlikely to curb a true addiction, but for many of us, a little bit of friction can be the difference between sticking with a good habit or sliding into a bad one. Imagine the cumulative impact of making dozens of these changes and living in an environment designed to make the good behaviors easier and the bad behaviors harder. Whether we are approaching behavior change as an individual, a parent, a coach, or a leader, we should ask ourselves the same question. How can we design a world where it's easy to do what's right? Redesign your life so the actions that matter most are also the actions that are easiest to do. Chapter Summary Human behavior follows the law of least effort. 
we will naturally gravitate toward the option that requires the least amount of work. Create an environment where doing the right thing is as easy as possible. Reduce the friction associated with good behaviors. When friction is low, habits are easy. Increase the friction associated with bad behaviors. When friction is high, habits are difficult. Prime your environment to make future actions easier.